Okay, so now we're in the last session of the first part of the course. And previously, we learned about uh, recruitment in the last session. And recruitment, if you remember, is simply the process of getting the word out that your organization needs somebody and then hoping um, and having confidence that people will apply, not just any people, people with the right credentials, the right set of competencies, attitudes, motivations that your company needs. And the idea is to get the right number of people with the right qualities at the right time with at the price that you're willing to pay, the compensation package. Now, hopefully, you did a good job with recruitment. You got the word out. It was motivating. It was compelling. Uh, and you had hundreds, if not thousands, of resumes come in. Um, and that the set of resumes, hopefully, they went in through an applicant tracking system like Talio. So you're doing e recruitment, right? You're not doing old school where a pile of resumes get emailed in or faxed in or mailed in, and you're pouring through those because you're not going to get through all of them. But with the applicant tracking system, of course, you can get through every single resume. So the next step would be to take that large applicant pool some of whom don't even qualify based on the minimum qualifications, the bare bottom basics. So you want to filter. You want to process them through a selection process called screening. And the analogy would be screening for, let's say, flour. You know, you have wheat, you grind it. It's not pure powder that you want to use for baking. So you apply a big screen to it to get out uh, all the unwanted particles, uh, the debris, whatever, the husk. Then you apply another filter, another screen to get maybe some of the useful materials like wheat germ and so on. And then ultimately, by the time you get to the final screen, and remember that does take time and it costs resources to do that, but the final screen will result in exactly what you want, which is a fine powdery flour that you can use, good quality, right? Uh, you can use a funnel, a funnel analogy as well. So we're going to look at the screening uh, or selection process. Now keep in mind though, there are organizations who, uh, when they're looking for somebody, they'll get a bunch of resumes. Now the bare minimum is written on the job description, right? So they take the resumes and the first person they find who fits the minimum requirements, they get the job. And that might be okay if you're hiring somebody low level on the hierarchy, maybe a, a let's say a machine operator, junior person, very entry level. You're only looking for bare minimum. But I think that our discussion on talent management leads us to believe that we should be a little bit more critical, a little bit more scrutinizing, a little bit more selective, because we're not just looking for the bare minimum skills, knowledge, skills, abilities. We're also looking for aptitude to develop into a future employee higher up and also the attitude to work in a team, in a group to adapt our corporate culture. Not every organization does that, but that's what the selection process is. So let's dig right into it. I'll bring that model back up, the model that we started in session one. We had a demand, right? We needed somebody, and we talked about how we initiate demand. Uh, we started the recruitment process, hopefully e-recruitment. We got the word out, however that might be. We got the word out, a lot of people applied. And now you see this first screen, the, the thick dotted line? That is that very initial basic screening. It's your basic filter. Does the person have the bona fide minimum qualifications? And they have to be bona fide, right? B-F-O-R, B-F-O-Q. They have to be legitimate. Do they have the minimum? And so you filter out. So out of 1,000 resumes, let's say you ended up with 500 that had the minimum qualifications. The others, they applied. And you shake your head saying, why the heck did you apply to this job if you don't have that credential? For example, if you're hiring an engineer... Well, to practice engineering, you need a license through the Professional Engineers of Ontario. You need a PNG next to your name. Well, a lot of people are just going to apply, hoping, thinking that the company might recognize their talent and forget about the certification. Well, unfortunately, the certification is a legal thing, right? But here's the cool thing. Um, if you did recruitment right, you are going to get a lot of people applying that don't even meet the minimum requirements. But that's okay because you got their resume. You got it. It didn't cost you any more to get their resume. And maybe they'll be suitable for other jobs like a technician or technical technologist type of a job. And because we're using e-recruitment and applicant tracking systems like Talio, we don't throw away those resumes. It's not like it's occupying space physically. It's just extra room on a hard drive and those are pretty cheap, right? 
So we keep those resumes perpetually because well, for a number of reasons. First of all, if the person you actually hired, after a month or two, you find out they're not going to work out because of attitude or personality clashes, you always have somebody else to pick. You have your applicant pool. It's still there. But like I said, that person could be suitable for other work within your organization as well. Why let the talent go? Right? There's a lot of people. There's 8 billion people on earth. And I'm pretty sure at least 3.5 billion of them are participating in the labor market. I mean, babies can't, right? We exclude that. So why not get choices from the largest possible pool that you can get? So anyways, we pass through the first initial basic screening. And let's say out of 1,000, we end up with 500. Now those 500 who pass over to the selection side, which I think is the most crucial, those are called candidates now. They were applicants here. That's the applicant pool. Now they are candidates, the candidate pool, right? So what do you do in the selection process to move them over here to the higher stage? You apply filter after filter after filter, and that's these little dotted lines here. Anywhere from one to many filters. Now, it could be that you're looking for a machine operator, or, or forget that here, a sweeper in the warehouse, like a custodian. Doesn't require a heck of a lot, a little bit of physical skill, maybe not as much communication skill. And maybe the first person that shows up, maybe it was a referral by an existing employee. Sure, the selection process is very thin, it's very short. You just say, sure, you, can you start on Monday? And you move them over to the higher side. That's fine, nothing wrong with that. Now, as an alternate, remember that if you get through the selection side and you don't want to do some of that because it's not your expertise for a certain type of job, then way at the beginning, why not pass on the entire recruitment and selection process off to an agency or a headhunter? And this is true when you're looking for highly specialized positions, a lot of executives, for example. Heck, we do it in Hollywood for actors, right? You call an agent, the agent looks, they scout, they look for the right talent, they bring them in. So it is possible, but it's costly. And if you have a, a robust kind of recruitment selection talent management program in your company and they hired you to do it, then it should be your job to do it and you save some money. But again, like I said, there is value for talent uh, for uh, agencies and headhunters, right? To use them in some cases. Now, what types of filters are we going to process this candidate through, right? So one of 500 people. Could you just get them to do the job and just watch them for a day or two? That might not be realistic because the person is nervous, they're anxious, it's a new environment. I don't think it's likely to have 500 people do the job for a week so you can observe them. Maybe later on, Later in the selection phase, you could get them to do the job or give them a realistic job preview and see what they think. But right now, I think we need to use other types of screening methods to process who's the best of the best. And remember, it's the best of the best that you can afford, right? Now, we talked about ATS, things like Talio, Workday that are part of an HR strategy, of course, they really help in the screening process, especially if they have some artificial intelligence built in. Because they, they let you electronically pick. So think about pivot tables. There's tons of data, and you're looking for a certain skill set. You can easily ask pivots to give me only people who fit this set of criteria. They've had five years experience. They have a PhD. They can speak French. They've worked in this industry. They've had that type of job. They can use Excel. I mean, it's data mining, isn't it? You don't want to do that manually. I think those days are over. So an applicant tracking system can actually automate a lot of this processing for you and along the way alert you if there's something wrong, some sort of a pattern that just doesn't match. And always remember, the candidates that you're looking at, their credentials on their resume, are matched up against an official document called a job description. So getting back to that section of job analysis... If you don't have job descriptions, you ask yourself, what am I comparing the person against? Now it becomes very informal and subject to bias. 
and human rights issues. It's rare that that would come up, but the thing is, it doesn't matter. You don't do HR in the hopes of not getting sued. You do HR in the hopes that you're creating an environment of fairness and equity as much as possible. Now, let's say out of 500 people that are candidates, they all are good. They're pretty much equal. They all fit the job description. I get it. Not one of them has anything more significant. Well, you can always go back to the job description and temporarily increase requirements. For example, I needed two years of work experience. I could go and now make that four years because I have the luxury. I've got a lot of people who fit that. Or I can add future type skills that are reasonable. Or, you know, for example, I had, I had uh, knowledge of Excel. Now I could say expertise in Excel or certain other designation or license. So if you had a thousand people apply for an HR coordinator job, that's awesome. And out of that, 800 of them meet the minimum qualifications. That's great. It's wonderful. You've got a large pool to choose from. And out of those 800, you applied some sort of a test. They all, you know, out of 800, they, 200 of them have five years plus experience. That's good. 200. How do I narrow that down to a handful? Well, I say now a CHRP or CHRL is a requirement. That's legitimate. Or you might say some other HR-related designation or project management certification or Taleo certification or Tableau certification. These are just extra layers that you can add to narrow down the candidate pool to a handful that you can now commit to interviewing and really scrutinizing because that costs money. Now, we talked about that initial screening, that basic screen, where we just look at every applicant that came in for minimum. Now, it is possible that if a person doesn't fit the minimum requirements, that maybe you can remove some of the minimum requirements. So, for example, if a person came in and, and they did a lot of volunteer work that uh, through predictive validation you feel would be a fit for your organization, that mindset, or a candidate who comes in and, and demonstrates on their resume that, sorry, an applicant, and they demonstrate that they know a lot about sustainable business management, and that's a thing we're looking for. It's not on the job description, but it's a nice thing to have. You can move people from applicant to candidate, even though they don't have the minimum requirements. But it will be ideal, of course, to flag those in your job description to begin with. Now, in the initial screening and later stages, we want to look for uh, two types of fits. And we're going to talk about this broadly at this point. There's a person-organization fit and a person-job fit. And you have to ask yourself, what's more important? A person-job fit is really what we're looking for. I mean, end of the day, you need a body in your company who can do the job, either physical or cognitive. The ones who have the competencies to actually get the job done. Because when they get the job done, you are producing, you're servicing a customer, you're administering. The organization stays um, healthy. They can move. It could be strategic in nature. So person job fit is exactly what you're, we're looking for. So take an engineer. An engineer who's got 10 years of experience building bridges, and you're looking for an engineer to build bridges. They have all the regulatory requirements. They, they have certification. They can do the job. Totally they can do the job. But in engineering school, they don't teach personality. They don't teach that, uh, what we call the people skills. We would hope that they would just pick them up along the way. But not every engineer, a brilliant, brilliant scientist, an engineer, might not have what we call person organization fit, a fit with the culture the personality of the organization itself. Think about it. Individuals have personality, right? But did you know groups of people have personality as well? Yeah. I mean, any one of you in my class has your own personality. I get to know you. I know who you are. But as a group, each one of my three sections, I, I can almost videotape you, uh, uh, you know, c communicating and connecting with each other and prove that all three sections have a distinct personality. The way you click, the way you help each other, how you answer questions and you encourage and motivate others. 
So your own department in an organization can have a personality. You know, at Seneca, we have the School of Leadership and Human Resources, and we have the HR program, three programs. So you know all the profs that you have, plus some part-timers. We have a personality as a group. We're actually admired by the, I mean, we do stuff. So everybody else in the college wants to be part of us, our team. Because we have a, a group dynamic, a group personality. But within that, of course, each one of us has varying personalities. And one maybe who doesn't have that personality, that attitude, um, that that students need, for example, or that other people need, the rest of the team fills that gap in so that we all look like a cohesive team. So that's something you're looking for. How closely does the applicant, their attitudes, their motivation fit with the organization itself? And there's various ways to tell. You can do personality assessments. We'll talk about that later. But sometimes just by asking the right type of hypothetical or situational questions during an interview, you can find out based on their responses, will this person fit? Do they talk the same in terms of answers, not accent? Do they think the same way? Can they answer a certain way? And we do that. When we interview for faculty, we ask questions such as, um, how would you deal uh, with a team member who, if you're choosing a new textbook and they disagree with something? Well, if we get consistent answers and it's in line with our values, our way of making decisions, then you know that person's going to be a good fit because they're what we call like-minded. Again, just to repeat, person job fit, I think, is important because a person needs to get the job done. But then you ask yourself, maybe they're not the best one to do the job today, but their personality is really good. They're a leader type person. They are charismatic. They can speak well. They're a communicator. You can always develop a person into the job, but it's that other part, the organization, the person organization fit side, the personality side that I think would be more difficult. And I think the higher up you go in an organization, the more senior you become, the more important the person organization fit becomes. Right? That's what leaders are. Leaders are charismatic personalities who can get other people to do something in common, to move the organization in a certain direction. And a good leader, of course, has to have the type of personality that allows, enables, empowers other people to get the job done, inspires even. And, of course, with a little bit of a tough hand. You have to be tough as well. Now, additional filters. Remember those dotted lines? Filters that you can use to narrow down the candidate pool. And I think the end result should be up to five people. You know, ideally you just want one, but it would be nice to have five just to be waiting. And out of those five, we want the one best that we're going to make a job offer to. So I'm going to get you some stuff from the textbook here. The textbook talks about this thing called a biographical information blank or BIB. Really? I've never heard that term used officially. It's a textbook thing, but you got to know it. It, it. Look, it's a simple application form. If you've ever walked into a retail store and you want to work, they're not going to ask you for a resume necessarily. They're going to give you an application form and you fill it out. They don't ask you for things that are very standard in nature. Now, the form, I could ask people to download it off the Internet, fill it, send it to us, or bring it in. Or sometimes you just give it to you right on the spot. Actually, you can go try this. Go to, a, uh, go to any shopper's drug mart or any Walmart. Go to the main desk, the customer service desk, and say, I'd like to fill out an application. They'll give you one. And remember, anything I mention in this course, or any course for that matter, uh, Google it. Google to find an example of what the heck this thing looks like. I've given you an example in my notes. So a BIB asks, some very basic questions like your name, your contact address, email, phone number. But then you also have to fill out things like your work experience. And it's not like you can describe it with a lot of words. These are just like, where did you work? When did you start? What type of job did you do? Your education, your interests. It looks like a resume to me. Get what it is. So in fact, didn't 
the applicant already give you their BIB by giving you their resume in the first place? Possibly, but some organizations don't have that mechanism. And by the way, I got to tell you, if you have a machine operator or warehouse employee, I don't think they walk around with their resume. They're just used to filling out a form. So here's an example, and I want you to look at this. The full example is in the notes. I've seen BIBs that ask some very sensitive questions. Let's take a look. Your address, your name, how long have you lived there? That's all legitimate. I mean, I'm not sure why we need to know that before we hire you. How long have you lived there? So remember privacy as well. What's the legitimacy of asking that question? Do you consider your net worth to be low, moderate, or high? Really? For what job? So although this is an example from the book, question it. Strike questions out. Have you ever been turned down for a loan, yes or no? Really? We can do a, a, a credit check. And how many credit cards do you have? Wow. Okay, so this obviously is not a good example. But I think, look, name, mailing address, that's good. Thank God date of birth isn't on here. Uh, level of education, that's legitimate. Degrees, right? That's good. They listed a few, a BA, BSC, BCom. I don't know how long ago this was written. What did you major? And these are all legitimate questions. Did you graduate with honors? That's good. Most of the time, we don't ask. Look, I'll be honest. When you graduate and you start looking for HR jobs, they're not going to ask you, did you graduate with honors? If you did, yeah, tell people about it. But it's not going to be a factor necessarily unless you're down to like three people and all of them are awesome. They want to look for that one more layer of awesomeness. Awards, that's okay. Scholarships, I'm not sure... Well, yeah, I guess, scholarships. Now, these are more of the questions that assess, I'm not going to say personality, but kind of the way you would think, your attitude towards work, your ethic. Did you find school stimulating or boring? Really? I mean, if somebody asked me that question, am I really going to say I found it boring? Maybe something like that comes up in an interview when I'm asking you the question myself, but am I really going to answer that? I mean, I, yeah. So all sorts of false negatives come out of this one or false positives in this case. Did you hold a job? Well, yeah, okay, I get, maybe we can ask that. How many parties do you go to in a year? Wow. Like parties as in political parties? Really, that's, I'm not sure, is a good question. <laughs> because whoever's asking the question better be trained to interpret the validity of the response and the relevance of the response against all of their answers. You can't just willy-nilly ask that. What's the premise? Is there a rubric somewhere that allows you to assess the answer to that? I go to one party and I find school boring. Does that make me a nerd? Hey, I'm looking for an engineer. I need a nerd. Really? So I threw this up here just to show you that a BIB, know what it is. I'm sure it's going to be a question on the HRP exam, but really we don't do this, okay? There's way more creative ways to screen. And in fact, you yourself as an applicant into the labor market should have a resume that answers questions in a way. The wording should make me believe that you are a stimulated person who takes work seriously. Now, interviews, I think, if I were to ask you, how do we screen uh, candidates, you would say interviews, interview them, right? Now, interviews, uh, many of you have been on interviews. Your exercise in the second half is going to be interviewing. You might be a good interviewer. You might not be a good interviewer. I have seen interviewers who are robots. They simply ask a question, write down the answers. But even within that, there are little subtleties. There are things like... How long do you wait? How long do you give? How do you control the time of the person giving the answers? Can you look at nonverbal cues? Can you tell if a person is overly excited and nervous and anxious and that's why their answer was not accurate? Or can you tell if a person's making something up? So good interviewers will develop that skill of how to do that. Many of you are already good at that. You're good judges. I have a family member 
that every time I talk, they sound like their their story is awesome. But at some point, I don't think they realize they're making it up. And I sit there and I listen. I never used to realize that, but I just got used to it. I just figured it out. Tell when this person's lying. And I don't say anything to them. Let them have their moment. Maybe it's a thing. It could be a mental health issue, I suppose. But if it becomes a danger thing, like they say, oh, go, go get that medication. It's going to help you. I probably put a stop to that. I mean, in life, you listen to people and you judge whether they're telling the truth or not or how accurate their response is. Use that. Leverage that when you become an interviewer. And I think many of you are going to be interviewing people just as a practice, whether you do this as a, as a specialty or not. Now, the interview itself, you know, I mean, listen, it could be face-to-face. -face. That's ideal, right? But quite often we do video interviews. Many of you have done telephone interviews. I mean, in these days, of course, COVID-19, we're not doing too many face-to-face -face interviews, although it's possible as long as you keep a distance. Video is good, Skype. Well, Zoom I wouldn't recommend. It's not private enough. Uh, WebEx, I think. Now, for jobs that require less scrutiny, like lower level, not executive jobs, one interview might be enough. Actually, none. Like I said, if, if you're looking for a machine operator and a person comes in, they were referral and, yeah, they can press buttons, you don't need to interview them. They applied, you saw them, move on. Hire them. It costs money to interview. But for some jobs, you might just need one interview. Person applies, you got their resume, they meet the minimum, you looked at the resume thoroughly, you compared against 10 other people, you bring them in, ask them a few questions, and that initial interview is going to be about verifying what's on the resume, what they reported earlier. Because I'm convinced a lot of people, they get others to write their resumes for them. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of services out there. We're not all writers, right? But then when you get somebody else to write your resume for you, you should know the resume. You know, in Hollywood, the script is not written by the actor. Somebody else writes a script. It's called a screenwriter. But then the actor has to know the script and make it their own, as if they wrote it themselves. So many of you, if I were to ask for your resumes and I ask you to explain things on it, you would struggle. No, why would you? That's the laziest thing you can possibly do. Just know this, the interviewer knows you're not comfortable or confident with what's on that resume. Especially if you exaggerated or made something up, you can totally tell. Now, the higher up you go, the more responsibility, the more um, breadth of uh, resources that the person might have access to or responsibility for, the more important of jobs in an organization, higher up, let's say managers, I think there'll be more than one interview. So the first interview might be with the HR person. Like I said, their job is simply to verify what's on the resume, check for some accuracy, check for uh, posture, check for confidence. And in some cases, you know, how well the person's groomed, if it's a bona fide requirement. But then the second interview might be with another person in HR, maybe the manager, who will check for more organic things like the personality, just to get a feel for the person. Uh, maybe ask more hypothetical, situational questions of what they can do, what they have done. How would they react in a certain situation? Those take more time and more energy. You don't want to do that with everybody. That you want to wait for fewer and fewer people to do the second interview. And there might be a third interview, just to double check. In the next interview, we're going to send them to the direct manager or, or supervisor of the department they're going to work for. Now, that manager or supervisor, their time is valuable. So before you send candidates over there, make sure that they're good. Now, in some cases, there could be seven, eight different interviews. And in fact, the interview, later on interviews, could be not just one-to-one -one interview, the applicant versus the HR person, but it could be one-to-many interviews where you are sitting in front of a panel and the panel gets to ask you questions. And hopefully the panel's trained that they go in order. 
and it's about probing and, and getting right down to how you would do certain jobs. It's called vetting, right? We're going to vet the candidate through a panel. So if on television you ever watch one of those Senate hearings or co committee hearings where a bunch of senators are sitting there and grilling somebody, generally that's the idea. But you don't want to be hostile about it. And there should always be an HR person there. So there are cases where there is one manager to many candidates that I think, yeah, I mean, we really shouldn't be doing that because when you put, let's say, five candidates, it's a matter of time. We just don't have time to interview everybody together. So we put five candidates together and one person asks all of them questions. So we're pinning one person against another to see who comes out with the best answers. Unfortunately, though, the first person who answers is, um, I mean, you, you know, you kind of have to wait their response a little bit more, be more sympathetic to that, because the last guy is going to take all the ideas, or the last guy says, my God, I can't copy their ideas, I have nothing else to say. But it would be nice if you're going to hire five people to work in a team, and then you could see how the five people support each other or work off of each other's thoughts. It is possible. Now, another screening method would be reference checks. I think um, you know what these are. And I told you in my earlier course, reference checks generally relate to calling a previous employer or manager from that company. And there's a lot of organizations right now who just aren't doing reference checks anymore. The lawyers are saying, look, the most you can do is answer, yes, they work for me and what job they did maybe the reason they left but now we run the risk of calling a previous employer and let's say we got permission from the applicant or candidate and, and quite often if it's on the resume you don't have to ask for permission because it's on the resume you can ask a previous employer but let's say that employer was not fair at all they had tremendous amount of bias and this person was a good employee they were let go because of personality conflicts bias on the part of that firing manager. Now that manager, of course, is going to say bad things. It's human nature for many people to just say bad things. They're not doing them any, any service. But on the other hand, what if the employee, your candidate, was a really bad, bad, bad employee, totally incompetent or smart but didn't get along with anybody, a toxic environment creator? And the reference manager that you call, they keep it neutral. They don't disclose any of the bad things. They don't give you that warning, and it, it was very sensitive, right? They just say, yeah, the person just left. So a lot of organizations just aren't doing that level of reference checks. I get requests all the time, and I do three every semester. Three people are allowed to use me as a reference. I've already got my three, by the way. And I all I ask is I go, look, I and, and I say yes or no. If I feel comfortable giving you a reference, like if you never talked to me all semester and you asked for a reference, I don't know who you are. But there's a few of you who've actually talked to me. Let me know things about you, your motivations, where you want to be. Yeah, but all I say is give me a heads up that somebody might call me. And then I either give you a very neutral reference. Or in many cases, I go a little bit out of the way and I say, yeah, I, I see this person fitting into this role. They've got the attitude, the aptitude the desire, a career plan. That can happen. But on the flip side, it might not happen. If you look at your candidates, their bosses might not give a good reference. Now, in some cases, um, you know, the reference could also be an academic reference. If you're a recent graduate, sure, certain professors who, I mean, listen, they've seen your work. You do projects in a course, that's actually work done, right? Right? You didn't get paid for it, but it was schoolwork that was realistic. So that professor would be in a good position to talk about certain things about you, certain characters, like your work ethic, your your presenteeism, your attitude towards work, your ideas, your creativity, your innovation. Background checks. Yeah, those are popular. We do them. And uh, keep in mind, these are a bottleneck. Uh, they do take time. They're not instant. 
We don't have a full blockchain. We talked about that earlier. It would be awesome if we just had a blockchain where we click a button. But the fear is, how do we know it's the exact person? So there has to be some sort of universal code, like a social insurance number. We don't have that yet. We're getting there. But when you want to do a background check, first of all, it has to make sense for the job. If you're going to hire a machine operator, you don't necessarily have to do a background check, except if you need a license to do it or drive a truck or a forklift. But if you're going to be a machine operator making um, airplanes for the Air Force, yeah, there will be background checks. There's security checks, of course. You're not going anywhere near those airplanes. So background checks include security checks. So if you're going to work in a bank and you're going to be dealing with, let's say, sensitive instruments or in a vault, I might do a local police check. And that's it's a simple process. You can Google how to do this. You go in. Uh, there's a form you fill out. There might be RCMP. RCMP is our FBI, by the way. It's like the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. It's like across the, the country. They have more data. And then Interpol is similar, but it's like... Um, it's worldwide, and it is a bottleneck. You put in a request today, it'll take quite some time. It's computerized, but you can ask Interpol for um, uh, if the person has any sort of record that might not be conducive to gaining the trust to do that job. So we're looking at very high levels. Like I'll give you an example. If I was hiring for the chief of surgery for a hospital, chief of surgery manages an awful lot of other doctors. I probably would do an Interpol check, especially if it's a, a foreign applicant. But the thing is, uh, usually you would do a license check with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, and you have to believe that if that body certifies this person to be a physician in Ontario, they must have done some vetting before that. So quite often we can trust that as well. It's like HRPA. You know, if you have a CHRP or CHRL on your resume, can we assume then that you've achieved the highest degree of certification in your profession? Because they do have a code of ethics, duties, responsibilities that you sign off on. Yeah, possible. That's the idea, but not necessarily. I mean, I've seen plenty of people who go and write that exam, you know, multiple choice exam. They pass, they, they sign off, they have a CHRL. But those same people are willing to do things that maybe are not ethical. It's possible. I, I threw a no-fly list. I think it's from the book, the textbook. But um, we do have a no-fly list after 9/11. And uh, you know, if you're gonna have, if you're gonna hire people who need to fly a lot, you hire a guy, and then six months later, you find out the guy can't fly. They can't do their job. It becomes sensitive because can you let them go at that point because of that? Well, you never bothered to find out. And it's not reasonable they would disclose that. Although you can ask a question, is there anything that will prevent you from flying around the world? Then it becomes a basis for termination. Because some people might have a medical condition that prevents them from, from flying. You can accommodate by saying, sure, you can take the bus or the train, but you can't do that to London, England. Who do you call for a no-fly list? I'm sure if you Google it, you'll find out. It's probably the RCMP. Academic credentials, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, when you apply, uh, your employer is going to see that you graduated from Seneca College in the HRM program. Okay, that's great. And we believe that you did. Rarely will we go back and ask Seneca. But when we do call Seneca, they're not just going to look it up right away. It's a process. They verify. They'll only verify, yes, they earned the credential. There's no website where we can look for a list of people who graduated. Again, privacy laws. Not sure why. But through blockchain, hopefully one day you can just click and check. Yep, they've got this credential. There's no way you could have faked it. It doesn't tell you how well you did in the courses. You could have squeaked through at 50s. It just says you earned the credential. Same goes with licenses, certifications. We've talked about that. Criminal records history, that would be back to security checks. More of an American thing. So remember, a lot of you are going to be working for organizations who either have expat employees or the employees are actually in another nation like the United States. 
And you have to deal with things like the Patriot Act and the Sox, Sarbanes-Oxley Act about financial disclosures and things like that. I won't get into detail on that. I think your employment law course did. You either hire a consultant in that country to help you with this, and there's a lot of them, or you would then become comfortable with how to do these checks. Now, remember, you're not the first one in your organization doing this work. So whoever used to do it is going to guide you. Your job is simply to do it. This is all the robot work, by the way. In some cases, a credit check. There's a lot of credit checking agencies out there. And you would do that, again, if you're handling a lot of money or you have the authority to sign off on loans and things like that. And, and the whole idea, the textbook idea used to be that if you have bad credit, a lot of loans, and you defaulted a lot, you might have a higher propensity to actually commit fraud, financial fraud. I, I'm not sure if that's true, but it was a commonly accepted thing. I'm pretty sure if you went bankrupt at one point in your life and that was documented that you are not going to get a senior loan officer job and that's legitimate. And then, of course, medical background. So there's a lot of professions out there where by law you have to do medical background, but sometimes it's not even the law. So, for example, athletes, professional sports athletes, basketball, baseball, football especially, the owners are paying a lot of money to keep these people, millions and millions, will insist on medical checks as part of their contracts. You have to. Airline pilots, they have to go in for physicals. A physical is a full checkup, mostly the heart, the eyes, cognitive ability. Makes sense, right? Glasses, but like your vision, right? That's what I'm talking about. Can we do a medical check for an HR person? Yeah, probably not. How about a food processing facility? Yeah. Used to be years ago, I don't know why they got rid of this, used to be that if you wanted to work in any restaurant in Ontario, Burger King, McDonald's, any restaurant, you had to get a chest x-ray done. They look for a thing called tuberculosis. Right? I don't. They don't do that anymore. But imagine that it takes time and it costs money to get this x-ray done and you're exposing yourself to radiation, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. You just can't get these every day. But what if the applicant or the candidate doesn't feel comfortable with that? Well, you lost a good candidate. It's not a discriminatory thing. It's a public health and safety thing. Now, employment tests is my favorite topic, one of my favorite topics, okay? I'll, I'm kind of just briefly going to go into this because in the second half of the course, there's an entire chapter on it. And I've talked about it before. Employment tests or pre-employment testing, that means before I hire you, is there any sort of test I could give you to see if you can actually do certain aspects of the job? Yeah, why not? I mean, in an ideal world, we would let people do the job for a week or two, the actual job see how well they do it. Because listen, if you had it on your resume, you can do this, then prove it to me, you can do it. And then if you can actually do the job, then I'll make the job offer. The problem with that is it takes up resources, it occupies space. There's insurance, liability issues around that. But we can always, you know, give certain tests related to the work a person's going to do. And these tests have to be valid, right? Criterion, relevance, I gave you the example in an earlier session about a pet food company that was giving an Excel test, legitimate test. It was for a supply chain logistics job. And the person had to use Excel, like a lot, to do their job. So what better way than to actually get them to do realistic stuff? Nothing over the top. Like there's some things in Excel that you can't be taught in a classroom. That's just the way that company does it. So you can't make them do something that's so obscure that eventually you'll learn it. But it's about how to apply Excel in a very generic sort of way. But that organization used a test that was too much about finance. And the supply chain people were not doing well in it. I mean, there might be that one guy who took a lot of finance courses who gets it. You can give language tests, language comprehension, written spoken tests. It could be a test um, about physical ability, meaning I'll actually make you lift 
a whole lot of boxes and articulately put them, stack them in a certain area. And quite often we create a fake kind of simulated work area called a vestibule. So somewhere in the back of my factory, maybe I'll just have a little room where I have old equipment and I just ask you to see how you would do whatever it is you do. You know, in the military, if you're going to apply, they put you through boot camp, but then they make you do things. Not that you're going to do it tomorrow, but you climb up a, a hill, you slide down, maybe firearms, swimming, whatever it might be. In golf, to become a professional golfer in Canada, you have to do a PAT, a playability test. You actually have to play golf. That's the best test ever. And there's a benchmark. Remember, there's always benchmarks. You, you, you can't just, yeah, you can do it or you can't. To what degree can you do it? So in the case of my Excel test, the way it was designed, right, in the workplace, I would say you need to have proficiency of at least 75 in it. That's what I'm looking for. I mean, I like 100%, of course. But you don't want to lose candidates because they're not at the optimal level. That can all be, always be developed in the future. What other types of tests do you think there are? Um, hey, astronauts, that's a good one. I mean, astronauts, before they get to fly a rocket, do you actually fly a rocket? Yeah, I don't know. Let's just say they fly. You have to go through all sorts of tests to see if you can, if your body can withstand the G-forces, the anti-gravitational forces. And can you breathe? How do you deal with stress? You forget things. What's your memory like? Oh, I like those memory tests. Those are good. And a lot of these tests, they look like SAT, standardized aptitude test. Okay, if you've heard of an SAT test, in the U.S., you have to take an SAT test to get into any university. But we have GMAT for management school, MCAT for medical school, PCAT for pharmacy school. These don't ask you to do necessarily a chemical formula like that. It's more logical type of tests. Can you think? Can you think under time pressure? And those tests are tough to begin with because there's so many people applying. They need a way to weed out, bell curve people out. It doesn't mean the people who don't make the cut can't become good lawyers or doctors. It means we have to cut it off at some point. So I want you to think about different types of tests, a math test, for example. You know, look, if I'm going to hire a social media specialist in my company, that's good. I might give them a test. Like, I'll give them about four hours, and they say, set up a account on LinkedIn. So for my company, a LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram. And I kind of know, I measured how long it sh should take the average person to open up those accounts. But then I'm going to give them another test that says, write a meaningful copy. Copy means a little blurb for each of those media. So obviously, uh, um, uh, Twitter has a smaller text format, limited number of characters. Facebook, you can go, go more. You can add graphics. And if a person within a course of six hours can write that on the fly for me, that's a perfect test to see if they can actually do the job. And, and I'll add elements of pressure in there as well, time pressure, maybe simulate noises that would happen in the office environment. And it has to be legitimate as well. I'm going to get back to airline pilots. I'm hiring you as a pilot to fly one of my commercial aircraft. It's a small plane, 40 passengers. Do I actually make you fly the plane? I'm sitting on one seat, you're sitting in the captain's chair. Is that the test I'm going to give you? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, that is not a test. That is not when you want to find out the guy doesn't know what he's doing. But I think I can trust that whoever certified this pilot, Transport Canada, they certified the pilot based on certain stringent requirements. And then I could trust that the person can actually fly. Now, their ability to fly into certain zones and deal with their staff and their their passengers, that may be a different type of a test we would give. So I should have put this slide up before, but um, uh, th these are some of the, the, 
the technical terms for each of the tests, right? You got your physical ability test, stress test. Firefighters, you get to do physical ability for sure. Police, climb up a ladder with 80 pounds on your shoulders and a hose. And how often can you do it? A stress test? Oh, I like this one. You know, listen, we're using virtual reality. I forgot to mention this virtual reality where you put these headsets on. So your eyes are inside this environment and we show you certain scenarios. And then we ask you to respond verbally or through, through the controllers in your hand, what would you do? Another stress test could be if you're an underwater welder, I want you to stay in a swimming pool underwater with heavy scuba equipment, breathing equipment for X amount of time. I mean, quite often stress tests go slightly above what the actual working environment will be. That's the stress. For an HR person, I'd love to give you a stress test. What I do is I put you in a room and I'd ask you to write all sorts of answers to questions uh, of things that would actually happen in the workplace. A difficult employee comes in, you get yelled at, there's an accident that just happened. But as you're doing that, I'd come and interrupt you with something else. Again, realistic, not way over the top. And I want to see how you can deal with it. But me personally, I would also calm you down. Like applicants, candidates, they come into an interview, a test, nervous to begin with. So I would use all sorts of techniques to calm that situation down, have a neutral sort of a uh, environment, the sound, the temperature, give you coffee, make you feel at ease. Now, emotional intelligence test. I'm not sure if you've ever done one before, an EI test. Uh, we talked about it earlier. I gave you a video. And there are some really good ones. That example that I gave you, you can try it. That's more of a fun one. But there are a lot of psychometrists out there, people who measure the psychology of emotion related to work. And you could buy these. All of these tests, you don't have to make these up yourself. Please don't in most cases. You can buy them. Like language tests, you can buy. In fact, you can send your employees to a language testing center. You know, it might cost you $1,000, but they will actually assess the language level of the employee. So an emotional intelligence test is uh, a bunch of questions to situations. You answer them, and it puts you on some sort of a diagram says this is what your level of emotional intelligence is. Quite often, it could be a score. You're at 80%, which means you have a heightened level of empathy and sense of sympathy that you're able to deal in situations where there are varied personalities who deserve different reactions from people versus, let's say, a knee-jerk reactor who will get angry, who doesn't understand other people. And they add elements of culture and ethnicity to that age tolerance. Psychomotor association test. You, you ever done one of these? Well, you do it every day. It's a test to see how your brain and your hand or your eye or any physical part of your body, how, they, how quickly you react. So I would give a psychomotor association test, the association between your brain and everything else. If you're going to fly a plane or if you're riding a bus, Right? I, I once took a driving course. It wasn't like your how to get your driver's license. I had my driver's license. But I remember this. It was um it was kinda cold. There was ice on the, the road and it was at a parking lot. And it was a company that charged money and they had all these very expensive cars, brand new. And what they do is they teach you how to speed right down the parking lot and then there are pylons where you have to weave in and out. And really, the person's looking to see how quickly my eyes, what my eyes see, what my brain processes, and then my hands, my feet, how, they, how quickly they react. And the very last test, and I'm not sure why, what were they thinking, but they put water on the end of the parking lot where the car's supposed to stop, and they, it, it formed into ice. So the instructor would stand at the almost just before the ice, and you're supposed to get your car going to 60 kilometers an hour, which is, could do a lot of damage. 
And just at the last minute, literally within like four seconds, if the instructor's hand goes to the right, your car should go to the left. If his hand goes to the right, your car should, or sorry, the other way, opposite. And everybody passed. I mean, they were taught. Uh, but the last one decided to go in the same direction as the hand. And so did the instructor. And he got hit. Uh, so again, I'm not sure why they did that, but it was, it was a pretty darn good test. But other psychomotor association could be if you're working on equipment. And, uh, you know, the, the, the speed with which you press buttons and the emergency button. Bus drivers I would do that with. Customer sensitivity tests. So there's, again, these are all hypothetical, situational, behavioral types of tests. It can almost go hand in hand with an emotional intelligence test. But it would test to see how well you can deal with not just customers, but other people. And hopefully it's related to the type of environment you're working in, like a restaurant, a retail store, a telephone type of a, a relationship with the customer. Operations test, those are simple. Can you use the equipment or not? I mean, you can't assume that the new generation knows how to use all equipment. No, you can't do that. I mean, there's an equipment. Here, use it. Show me. Forklift. Can you drive a forklift? No, show me. We talked about the medical test. And then within that, of course, would be drug tests, right? Uh, we've all heard of these. Um, can you be tested for drugs? Well, I mean, if you're going to the Olympics, you know, I mean, that's a legal thing. It's a requirement where you get tested for drugs, for steroids. Um, yeah, that's legal. But can you just make everybody take a drug test? And by the way, the, the HR department doesn't do the drug test. Okay, relax. We send you to a doctor or an office that does drug tests or testing. They do it. They take a sample of your blood. And then they come back, or your urine, whatever it might be. And then they come back, and they tell you, yes, the person has used drugs in the last two days or whatever it might be. The thing is with this, if you know you're going to be subject to it, and you have to tell people in advance you're going to be subject to a drug test before you hire them, then, of course, you can fake it. In the U.S., this is huge. But with jobs that require an element of public safety, or access to sensitive resources or equipment like a pilot. Of course, drug tests should be necessary. And the big controversy was drug tests of bus and TTC, Toronto Transit Commission employees. Remember that? The bus drivers and the union said, no, no, I can't do it. So they randomized it. So on a random basis, you don't know when we're going to ask you for a test, but we're going to ask you. And a whole lot of bus drivers were tested positive for this particular drug test. That's yeah, possible. Do you know there's employers in the U.S., in many states, they use this thing called um, at-will employment. And it's basically, the employer says, look, my medical health care costs are huge. You take drugs, it's obvious it's going to hurt somebody at some point, possibly. But they also will test you for things like diabetes and heart conditions and so on. And then they'd say, look, if you want to keep your job, we're going to accommodate, but you've got six months or a year to stop smoking, change your diet, or we'll let you go. I'm not sure where that's going, but it was pretty hot a few years ago. Employers are doing it. It's called at-will employment. Look into it. Now, we talked about validation and if you buy tests or you get a service to do the tests for you and they have psychometrists, et cetera, ex experts, scientists involved, they're going to make sure that the tests are valid content and validation, criterion validation. And how they apply it is in a consistent manner and it's accessible, right? These are, I think, obvious at this point in time. And, of course, free from bias. Some tests, like personality tests, do require interpretation like the DISC model or true colors so make sure the person who is interpreting is free from bias and quite often these tests are done in a blind way where you don't know who the candidate is it's just a number 
So you can't associate their physical characteristics to the results. Unless, of course, the test was about that. Like for a model. And remember, document everything. Your lawyer will say document, document, document. All of this you do during the screening process should be documented. And that's where systems like Talio, Applicant Tracking System, come in. There's a place quite easily for you to put in all the notes, call logs, expenses, feedback from interviews, and then automate that whole process. Alert people about this these notes that you're taking. And there's two ways to, to take notes, okay? One is just free-form notes. It's just, you know, in a word, you have a laptop or just on paper, you're just writing down notes. And hopefully it's somewhat formalized in that you're writing notes by criteria or by question. But I think it's more important to do a criteria checklist. And there's an example of it later. It's in the notes. It's where everything that you are scrutinizing, everything you're looking at in a candidate, all this stuff we just talked about, should be in sections. And each item should be weighted, should be worth something. There's almost like a checklist. Yes, they have it. No, they don't. But I'm a fan of saying on a scale of one to five, how much do they have it? And then some elements of screening maybe are worth more. So for example, if person to job fit is worth way more to you than person to organization fit, then person job fit might have a weight of 10. And person organization fit might only have a weight of 4. So you score both of them. That's fine. You look at it from a valid point of view. But then one, the result is worth a lot more than the other. So in an HR job, if your CHRP is worth one, that's fine but your knowledge of Excel might be worth six. That's good. Your knowledge of the Employment Standards Act might be worth five. Right? So as you assess, it's, it's weighting it for you. You're not looking at every skill as equal. In fact, it's almost like factor and sub-factor analysis when you do pay, uh, what do you call that? Um, pay analysis, I guess. What do you call it? Yeah, pay analysis you did it in compensation I forget what it's called not job analysis the other one and it's sort of like what you do with pay equity so I just talked about the weighted selection form sheet and there's an example of it all right and I think actually I know that in part two of this course your assignment and by the way in part two they're, they're, it, it's it, the marks are there for you okay take them just do the job well. It, it's, it's not difficult, so it's a substantial amount of marks available to you for doing things, but the trick is, I'm going to tell you right now, is don't just do the minimum. Like, don't do what every other example is doing. Make it your own. Make it a little bit more interesting. But one of them is a weighted selection form sheet that you're going to have. Here, it looks something like this. So, first of all, the candidate's understanding of the position itself. I'll ask questions, I'll interview, I'll do tests, I'll find out how much do you know about the position, the job itself. And I'll give you a rating in this box. Let's say it's on a scale of 1 to 5. So down here I'd write down what 1 to 5 is. 5 is the highest. I put a 5 here, and I multiply the 2. 5 times 10 is 50. But you see the relevant background special skill set? It's a very specific skills that you need. I'll give that a score of 3. And 3 times 15 is 45. So although this is worth more, the candidate got a less of a score on it. Oh, there you go. So that's my rubric. How do you decide what a 5 is versus a 4? I've written down a very clear statement. So if whatever you find out from the candidate resembles or is similar to this statement, then you would give them a score of five. And there's always a subjective element. I get it. There really is, okay? In some cases, we allow for a score. It's called a four up or a four down. Four up would be a four and a half or a four and a tick. 4.1, sometimes down. Some organizations say, no, leave it as a five or a four or three. And that's when you have a lot of candidates you're looking at. But when you only have a few good candidates left, 
you might want to get into that little nitty gritty granular point ones and point two, so four point one, four point two. It separates that little nuance, that little special thing one person has versus another. Now, I want to talk a bit about the metric side of recruitment and selection. Uh, we mentioned a few early on, and remember, there's tools like Excel and Pivots and Talio to help you along with this. But one of the metrics that I think you should keep track of for sure, and by the way, Talio does it automatically, is called selection or yield ratios. Now, I know the chart here is a little bit fuzzy, but in the document, I've given you a full version of this. It's actually in Excel. Now, let's say you had sources. Source, you're looking at sources now. Source A, B, C, D. So let's say Seneca, U of T, Sheridan, and York. This tells you how many applications came in. And that's important because it tells you how many people have developed a liking or an affinity with your organization or how well you promoted at these places. That's good. Now... From source A, Seneca, 30 out of the 50 made it past the initial screening process, a bare minimum screening. So that's 60% ratio. And that's pretty good. If you find that the number of applications coming in result in a very low ratio after initial screening, it means that the quality of the people that you're attracting through your recruitment methods is low. You know, you advertise in the, in the Toronto Sun, I think that's still a paper, for executive jobs, of course you're going to get very low quality. And by the way, sources are not just educational institutions. It could be like the newspaper you advertise in, agencies that you use. Now, of those 30 that made it through, I interviewed them. Interview one, 20 of them made it through. So 40% of the original went forward. Or you can look at it as 20 out of 30 people made it forward. But I'm left with 40% of the original. Then after interview two, 20% interview or the employment test one, 20% employment test two. And I'm left with 10%. So see, after the background checks, how many are left? After the reference checks, after the offers made, 6% of them were given offers and we hired one of them which is two percent and that's not bad we actually managed to find a good candidate from source a but look at source b wow that's consistently high quality stuff 88 75 all the way to the end we hired two people from that source that's a good five percent so next time for this type of a job you know you should go to source b because they seem to be a good source of candidates, applicants and candidates for that particular type of job. This is called selection or yield ratio. Not everybody does it. But if you set it up in Excel or in Talio and you put it on graphs, it actually, you, you almost get to see indicators or patterns. So for example, if you're looking for animation, graphic animation people for Disney or Pixar, you know, Humber, or sorry, uh, Seneca College has a great program. It's a one-year program. It's awesome. And then Sheridan College also has a program. In fact, they were the first to open. The Queen of England actually opened that facility over in Oakville. I remember that. I was there. But Seneca is relatively new. But I got to tell you, Seneca has won, won directly and 19 indirectly Oscars for the work that our people, our facilities have done on animations. Now, I could stereotype and say the only place I'm going to go is Seneca because they won Oscars and Sheridan has not. But if I do selection ratio like this, and I find after uh, uh, you know several years of recruiting people from Sheridan or Seneca, I find that you know the candidates from Sheridan tend to, first of all, make it through every step of my selection process, higher percentage of them. So the next time, go to Sheridan first. But then, remember, follow up on this. Say, six months down the line, the performance of those people that I've hired through Seneca tends to be the most. The turnover of the people I hired from Seneca 
tends to be the least, meaning the graduates of Sheridan, and by the way, I have respect for Sheridan, I'm just using this as an example, but their turnover was higher. They come and then they leave. Or their performance was not as high. Once you set this up, it's relatively easy to manage and look at. Don't forget, conditional formatting also helps. Hey, look at source C. We used an agency to find me some of these people. Zero, 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 zero. Guess what? Don't use that agency again. Or ask for a different agent. Now, a topic I said I would cover early, I think your law course talked about it. I think we all need to think about it, is when can you or should you use social media for selection purposes? You use social media for recruitment. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. If you find out that engineers have their own special Facebook page where they post all professional stuff and maybe some fun stuff, then start getting into that group and telling people about the job you have. That's awesome. Of course. Pinterest, why not? That's just getting people in. But once they're candidates, can you then look at their social media or their public-facing profiles to determine if they are suitable to hire? Well, I'd say yes and no. First of all, we have a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And that says that you're allowed to have a life different from your work life, personal life versus work. You're allowed to engage in behavior that might not be appropriate to some, but to you it is. That's what life is about. We live in a democracy, in a free society. So you as a potential employer, you go into a candidate's LinkedIn profile. And in LinkedIn, you find out that they, are, they found it and they're the president of the Cannabis Liberation Front. Cannabis meaning marijuana. Now, that changes things if when it was illegal. But now it's legal. Well, can you not hire that person because of it? Do you have the science that says that if you engage in cannabis culture, that you are not that good, that your brain is fried? I heard that on the news. Those are not my words that you can't think anymore, or maybe you can prove that, hey, they got a heightened cognitive ability. But can you prove that because this guy started this movement that he, in fact, is taking the, the drugs? Not necessarily. These are all sensitive areas. Now, if you have two candidates that are exactly the same, and this employee is one of them, this candidate, sorry, you could then say, well, the other one doesn't participate in drug culture, Maybe it's not a risk worth taking, so you hire that person. That could happen, and it does happen. I don't, I'm not sure there's anything wrong with that. But what about other types of social media? LinkedIn, by the way, if the guy actually put that on his LinkedIn, he's taking a risk, right? LinkedIn should be only professional profiling. But then I find that person on Facebook, so their LinkedIn is perfectly professional. But on Facebook, one of the candidates is posting and reposting, or on Twitter, retweeting all sorts of comments that are supremacist, racist in nature. It's not. There's nothing illegal about it. I think our Constitution protects freedom of speech. It's just not right. I mean, unless it's really heinous, right? But... Can you hold that against the person? Well, here's the problem. First of all, can you 100% verify that that is actually that person? Especially if they don't have a picture. Look, I'll be honest. Go Google Ash Patel. Do it. That's not me. It's not me. And if you say, yeah, but he looks like you, really? My people don't all look the same. Come on. You get the idea, right? Google Ash Patel. Most of them are not me. I'm not a doctor. And I'm not the ex-senior vice president of Yahoo. I did not invent Hotmail. I mean, I'm there. And I have two or three profiles out there. There's one of them you'll never guess it's me. 
So you have to be very careful. But let's say that you did find me on Facebook and then you found out that I'm posting all this stuff that's sensitive and you get offended by it. Does that make me a person whose class you should not attend? Should Seneca fire me? Because I'm participating in a type of subset of culture that my students might not agree with? Let's say drugs or hate or, I don't know, I'm trying to think what else is sensitive out there. I can't say anything because I'd be stereotyping. You know, for example, if I'm posting all sorts of stuff like COVID 19 is a hoax invented by deep state government, it's not real. First of all, that would make me look like an idiot. It really would, because I'm not thinking scientifically. And that would probably disqualify me as being a top candidate for a teaching job because my opinions are not well informed. In fact, I'm capable of spreading non truths. My ethics are a little bit thwarted. And that in itself, because if one of the things to hire an academic is to think objectively and present in a factual, scientific sort of way, then I've proven myself not worthy. But you have to be careful. I haven't quite figured out Facebook, and I, I know other people post, and it shows up on my wall, and I get upset all the time. Will somebody please teach me how to do this? Because I look, and I go, I did not post that. That's not mine. All because they're a friend of mine. Now, if I don't understand that part of Facebook, I honestly don't. Imagine other people don't either. So if you're going to dabble in social media, know what the hell it is, okay? Wait, did I just say it that way? Yeah, I did. Know it or hire somebody who does know it. They're called social media specialists. But any one of you can learn how to use social media. Now, let's say we're looking for a president, a president of Seneca, who is the public face of Seneca, whatever our president does, what they say, how they look in public, all affects confidence in our great institution. I'm convinced people will not come to Seneca if they believe that our president was engaged in an activity that is not conducive to their beliefs. And I don't mean in a subtle sort of way you're a different religion or anything like that. I'm talking like sensitive stuff. So, of course, the president... As soon as they get hired, they have to be super careful. Very careful how they portray their public image. And if it means shutting down their social media profiles except LinkedIn, so be it. If you're working in a job of fiduciary duty, access to resources or a lot of um, the type of work you're doing could affect the lives and health and safety of others. Then, of course, we have a little bit more leeway in terms of looking at social media posts. So if a person was out there on LinkedIn with just squeaky clean, perfect professional, but they're, they have a huge Instagram site, I guess you call it, channel, I don't know, and it was all about ethnic supremacy, and they were, you know, reposting all this stuff that was hate or dislike of a certain group. Well, I mean, you've lost trust right there. Then how are they capable of protecting other people's rights or treating everybody without bias or prejudice. We don't know that. Maybe the person's the nicest guy on earth, but then they have to be very careful how to associate. And again, don't quote me on any of this as the courts haven't really figured this out. I'm giving you my personal opinion. So you yourselves, of course, please, if you have other things that you engage in, it's fine. Nothing wrong with it. But because you're looking for work soon, just make sure that every aspect of your public profile is squeaky clean just for now. After the fact, it's fine. I know we have protections. But not everybody thinks like you. Not everybody's fair and ethical in that way. People judge. You know that. Come on. Society wouldn't be what it is if people didn't. And you don't want to take that risk. So it's a... It's, yeah, I have rights, but on the other hand, let's just keep things calm for now. Let's project a balanced and somewhat neutral image. I mean, actors do it, don't they? Why are actors so devastated, or actors or news people, when the slightest bit of off news comes out for them? Anybody else wouldn't be phased by it, but they do, because it's their bread and butter. It's, it's how they earn their living. So some food for thought. 
I don't know how much you know social media. I just proved I don't know Facebook. I just don't get it. I'm trying Twitter. I think Twitter hates me now. But what are the most common social media platforms? I mean, LinkedIn, yes. But then can you dabble in it? Can you look into some of these and get some expertise? There's YouTube videos. Can you see how a paid service, how you can pay LinkedIn to mine the candidates for you? Can you scrape this data, gather it? Like, can you grab data from social media? Because, look, I'm not going to pay you to sit and look at everyone's social media all day. I know you'd love to. But can systems like Talio scrape the data? Yeah, is it possible? Maybe. Yeah, of course it is. That's how Google and Facebook make their money. How do we ensure that we're looking at the right person? I had a friend when I was younger. His name was Young Sup Yun. He was like my brother. We traveled everywhere. Awesome guy. He was like my brother that I never had. But one day he left. He's a South Korean. He left. He went to teach English in South Korea. So I lost touch with him. And he came back once, said hi. Then he went back and he got lost completely. No response to any emails. I even chased after where his family used to live, the store they used to own. Nobody's heard of this guy. Then one day I said, yeah, I'm going to go Google search him. Young Sup Yun. Every variation of the spelling. And I found six or so Young Sup Yuns on Facebook, none of which had a picture. And I kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay at looking at this stuff to put two and two together. You know, he was doing a, a master's degree in biochemistry and his thesis was called the, the reaction of cytotoxic T cells on aversion rates of mice in this population. I don't know, something like that. So I thought maybe I could just find something, something. I, I never could. So what would be the danger of me assuming that one of those people was Young Sup Yun? There's no image wasn't there. But I could never verify it was the right person. I want you to question social media. But harness the power as well. It is powerful stuff. In the second half of the course, you're going to get a new professor coming in. So you have a week break. And the new teachers, either Kamini or Rupi, they're going to talk about selection testing and other assessments. So although we talked about it, they're going to go into more detail. Interviewing, so that's where you got you going to start learning what interviews are in a direct way. How to write interview questions. And there's a whole section on decision making, which I think you've already covered in some other course to some extent, but again, a revisit. And then you're going to see how a real hiring process works. And I'm going to get you started, or I already have actually, Using Talio, you're going to look at some law clerk student that will be assigned to you. And you're going to create a posting. Hopefully, you already have a good one. Post it on Talio. Get that law clerk student to apply on Talio. You're going to look at their resume. You're going to schedule an interview with them. And, and in these days, of course, that interview will be over the phone or via Blackboard. And I'll set that up for you, or I already have. And then you're going to take notes feedback, keep track of certain information on Talio. So by the time you get to the second half of the course, not only will you have a posting based on a job description given to you, you're going to have all sorts of questions you're going to use, structured interview style, questions you're going to use during an interview, hypothetical, situational, probing questions, and you're going to take notes on how the interview went going to document everything, provide an assessment. I think you might even record that interview. I'm not sure. We'll figure that out, or at least by this time you would have known. And that'll be a huge percentage of your mark. Then there's also a final test in the second half. Now, the final test in the second half will cover those three chapters, testing and other assessments, decision-making, and interviewing. And that's worth, I think that's only 15%. And that'll be in week 13 or 14. So take a few days off. Ask me questions. And we'll keep in touch. Mm -hmm.